Uh, the next speaker is Earl Miller. Earl is at the Pickhour Center for Learning and Memory in Boston, or actually Cambridge. And he's had a longstanding interest in perception and cognition, and in particular in the last number of years been working on the prefrontal cortex and its role in executive control. And again, he's one of these labs that just does, seems to do everything from psychophysics to uh, electrophysiology to imaging to pharmacological manipulations. And so Earl will tell us about his latest story. Brain Rhythms and Cognition. Thank you very much, Katja and, and Alan, for inviting me to this, this uh, really fascinating symposium. Um, the dominant model for how the brain codes information is something known as rate coding. Basically, neurons are thought to integrate their firing over time. So what matters is the level of firing rate of, of, of neurons. And the timing of uh, spiking of neurons didn't seem to matter so much. At least that's the class, one, one, of, the, uh, one of the views of uh, information coding in the brain. But over recent years, we've seen an increase of evidence for th that um, spike timing, that the exact timing of spikes may play a critical role in brain function, particularly in higher order cognition. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, of, we heard some of that from Sabine today, and of course Charlie Schroeder is sitting here in the third row. He's done some beautiful work on this. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of our recent work on the role of um, of synchronized brain rhythms in forming uh, neural ensembles. So I thought I would start just by telling you a little bit about our techniques, and I won't spend a lot of time on it. Like uh, we use techniques similar to Sabine. We record from um, um, multiple electrodes, both within and across cortical areas. And the advantage of recording from multiple neurons and multiple signals in the brain simultaneously is allows direct measurements of the detailed timing of activity that you can use to infer network properties. So one of the questions we, want, we sought out to answer recently is something that was raised um, earlier today by John Donahue. How was a neural ensemble assembled from large populations of highly connected neurons? Now, of course, a neural ensemble is thought, all information in the brain is thought to be represented by a neural ensemble, basically a subset of neurons that forms a particular thought or perception uh, or a neural computation. And the problem is, is that it, how, do, how, do you, how do you pull a, neural, we have a whole bunch of neurons that are highly interconnected, which is the way the, the cortex seems, how do you pull a particular neural ensemble out from this, this um, interconnected circuitry? And however it does it, however neural ensembles are formed, they must have a um, key feature, and that is they must be able to support cognitive flexibility. Uh, it so whatever formats used to form ensembles, it must be in a format that allows them to be changed and reassembled from moment to moment as we change our thoughts from, from moment to moment. Now one possible hypothesis, one possible solution for this is to have ensembles formed by oscillatory based uh, synchronization. Now the idea here is you have these uh, neurons that are all embedded in, the, in this circuit here. And you have two ensembles here, one represented by purple, one represented by pink. And the idea is that whenever the pink ensemble is activated, whenever the pink ensemble is um, activated, the neurons that are from the nodes of that ensemble are oscillating in synchrony with one another. And neurons that form another ensemble, like this purple ensemble, they oscillate together in a synchrony with one another and out of synchrony with the, with the, uh, with the or at least in a different um, synchronous relationship with the, with the other ensemble. So we sought to um, test this by recording from multiple electrodes why monkeys switch back and forth between two tasks, two, two attention demanding tasks. Uh, this is the task here. Um, uh, the monkey sat um, facing a computer screen. They fixated a spot of light when they maintained their, that's the red circle indicates the monkey's eye position. The monkeys kept fixated on this, um, on this uh, spot of light until the very end of the trial when it made its behavioral choice out here during the response phase. Um, the very first thing that happened is why the monkey maintained central gaze, two target um, dots appear on the right and left, which the monkey wasn't allowed to look at yet. But the first thing that happened was the monkey saw a rule queue around, around the uh, um, um, outside of the uh, computer screen, the frame of the computer screen. And if this rule queue was pink, the monkey had to pay attention to the color of the forthcoming stimulus. If it was blue, the monkey had to pay attention to the orientation of the forthcoming stimulus. So this is a, then, then a test stimulus appeared, and the test stimulus was a colored oriented bar. It was either a bar that was vertical or vertical or horizontal, or it was red and blue. And what the monkey had to do is make a saccade in one direction based on the color, like saccade to the right if, if the stimulus is blue, saccade to the left if the stimulus is red, or if the monkey's paying attention to color. 
If instead the monkey is working under the orientation rule, has to pay attention to orientation, and it ignores the color of this test stimulus and makes a leftward saccade if the stimulus is vertical and a rightward saccade if the stimulus is horizontal. So very simple, well, not simple task, but it's a simple task in the sense that the monkeys have to either go back and forth between either paying attention to the color of this test stimulus or, or the orientation. So this phase here where we cue the rule to the monkey, the monkey's preparing to um, use the rule. Then during the test stimulus phase, the monkey's executing the rule. Okay, so we recorded for multiple electrodes in, in, in the prefrontal cortex while monkeys switch back and forth between these, ta these two tasks. And what I mean by me is my students, uh, Tim Bushman and er Eric DiNovellis and, and Sinera Diogo, who is a post postdoc in my lab. This is a paper, by the way, that was recently accepted for publication by the good and wise people at Neuron. And here's a here's a, and just to remind you what we're looking for, we're recording in the prefrontal cortex, and we're looking for evidence that for neural ensembles that represent these two different rules the monkey is following. So again, now what we're looking for is os oscillatory-based neural ensembles. And what we tested for in this experiment, what I'm about to show you, is we looked across all pairs of simultaneously recorded neurons to look for oscillatory coherence between the local field potentials and spikes, which I won't have time to tell you about today, but local field potentials of all pairs of these simultaneously recorded electrode, now, electrodes. Now remember, what we're looking for here are whether pairs of electrodes Recordings from pairs of electrodes show this synchronization that is rule dependent. So, so different patterns of electrodes, different pairs of electrodes should go into oscillatory synchronization depending on which rule the monkey is following. And of course, that's what we found, or I probably wouldn't be telling you about this, this experiment. So this is a complex slide. Um, let me walk you through it. This, uh, so on the x-axis is time during the trial. So out here, zero is when the testimus is presented and the monkey's executing the rule about right here. Then a short while later, the monkey makes its behavior response, saccade to the right, saccade to the left. And on average, about it's a variable time, but on average, about 200 milliseconds before the test stimulus was presented, the monkey gets the rule cue. So the monkey can prepare to execute the rule and then execute the rule. And then here's where the monkey makes its behavior response. What's shown on the y-axis is frequency of oscillatory coherence between pairs of electrodes. Um, the Bluer color means that there was stronger oscillatory coherence for stronger oscillatory coherence for when the monkey is following the orientation rule, and the pink color means there's stronger oscillatory coherence between electrode pairs and the monkeys performing the color rule. Now, we're, when we record from our electrodes in the PFC or anywhere in, in, in the monkey's brain, we, we, we drop our electrode arrays down and the, we randomly record from any, any, any place we could isolate neural activity. And we found, this is, these are electrode grids that are about a one millimeter spacing. That's a pretty um, wide spacing in the, in the brain. Nonetheless, we found that 45% of randomly selected electrode pairs in the prefrontal cortex showed rule selective increases in synchrony in the beta band shown here. About half the electrode pairs showed increases in beta um, synchronization for the orientation when the monkey was following the orientation rule. And the other half the electrode pairs showed an increase in beta um, band oscillations when the monkey was following the color rule. There's some slight differences. There's higher frequencies for orientation than color. And it's been recently showed, um, proposed that actually changes in the frequency profile can also help code inf information in the brain. But let's just ignore that for a minute. And what we're showing here now are these two different um, sets of electrode, electrode pairs, and they had pointer problems there, on um, two different sets of um, electrode pairs. One set of electrode pairs that shows beta band coherence for the orientation rule, another set of electrodes that shows beta band coherence uh, during, during the color rule. So what you see here is around the time that the monkey is executing the rule by paying attention to the, either the orientation or the color of the test stimulus, you see this increase in beta band synchronization for, the, for, for one subset of electrodes for one rule orientation and for the other rule or color. So what does that mean? What that means is that we have these two networks here. Here's a network, here's the, uh, net, the cartoon representing the beta orientation network here below it, and a cartoon representing the color orientation network below it. And what happens is that when the monkey's executing the color rule, here when the test stem was presented, you see a certain pattern of electrode pairs show beta band coherence as if they're forming this oscillatory based beta color rule ensemble. When the monkey's performing the orientation rule, we see something a little bit different. We see a different pattern of electrodes shows an increase in beta coherence for the orientation rules. If there's this other beta oscillation defined um, ensemble for uh, orientation rule versus the other ensemble for the color rule. 
So that's all well and fine. It seems to support our, um, our uh, hypothesis that there's these oscillatory neural ensembles can be formed via synchronized oscillation acro oscillations across, uh, across uh, uh, neurons. But one thing you may be asking yourself is, what, what about these lower frequencies? Why have I stopped this here at, at 20 hertz? Well, that's because I just wanted to you know, increase the drama a little bit, what happens here at these uh, lower frequencies. But what happens here, we found something very, um, very uh, uh, weird, at first anyway. What we found is that we found alpha coherence in one, ensem uh, one uh, ensemble and not the other ensemble. So what we saw is that when, when, the, um, when the monkey's preparing during the rule preparation period, when the monkey's preparing to follow one of the rules, we see this blast of alpha band coherence between, uh, between um, electrode pairs for, during, uh, for the orientation uh, um, ensemble, but not for the color ensemble. So let me repeat that. Alpha band during the rule preparation period, alpha band coherence for the orientation ensemble, but not for, the, um, not for the color ensemble. Now, why is that? Why would we see this asymmetry? Why is only alpha in one ensemble, not the other ensemble? Well, one thing you may notice here is if you look at the color coding here, remember pink is stronger coherence, stronger synchronization for the color rule, and blue is stronger synchronization for the orientation rule. And what you can see here is that we see alpha band coherence, alpha band synchrony in the orientation ensemble but only when the other rule, color, is relevant. So in other words, what we see is that only the beta orientation network, only the beta ensemble, orientation ensembles, shows alpha coherence, but only when the animal is preparing to perform the other rule, color. Now, why is that? Why, why, so what, what, well, what this suggests is that when the monkey's perform, performing the orientation rule, there's an orientation ensemble and, um, in, defined by beta, beta coherence, uh, and the um, color beta ensemble is silent. But whenever the monkey's about to perform the color rule, the brain blasts the beta orientation ensemble, this blast of alpha, which then shuts up during, during the ex execution period so that this other network can form an ensemble. Now, why is that? Why? Well, the reason is because there's some behavioral data, which I haven't shown yet, I won't get a chance to show you. We saw, we looked from analysis of the animal's behavior, specifically the switch cost as the monkey goes back and forth between two rules, we found that the orientation was the dominant modality of the monkey. The monkey had an easy time paying attention to orientation and a harder time paying attention to color. It's so like Stroop effects. The monkey's just orientation was easily captured the monkey's attention. As a result, it was harder for the monkey to pay attention to color. So what this suggests is that the, this alpha um, coherence here may suppress or deselect the dominant orientation network in order to get it out of the way when, when the monkey has to perform a, a behavior based on the weaker, less established color network. So orientation is dominant, color is weaker, and what the brain may do is just blast the, the dominant um, ensemble with a blast of alpha to quiet it down so the monkey can follow a rule that's established by, a, by the weaker color ensemble. Now, this is not just an, I've been t focusing on the local field potentials here between electrode pairs um, to save time, but I, I can tell you that it's not just an LFP phenomenon. We see these um, coherences between individual spikes and LFPs that, that, um, that um, is consistent with this idea of these two different rule ensembles. Neurons that are, show selectivity for orientation or neurons that show selectivity for color, they show synchrony to the appropriate orientation or color network when the animal is executing that particular, uh, that particular rule. Now, what this shows here, here's a plot, a map of all the different recording sites across different recording sessions where, where we, uh, where, that we tested in the prefrontal cortex. This is the lateral prefrontal cortex. Posterior here, anterior is here. This is, the, this, this is reverse, but this, the, this is the arcuate sulcus here and the principal sulcus. So it's right over the lateral prefrontal cortex. And what we found is that on the left here is where, where we found the line show where we found significant correlations in beta for the, when the animal is performing the orientation rule versus the color rule. And as you can see, these networks just sit on top of one another. So what it suggests is that you have all circuitry in the prefrontal cortex, all these neurons all intermingled there in the prefrontal cortex. And what the beta oscillations do is pull the appropriate network out of the circuitry when the animal has to perform that particular rule. Okay, so to sum up so far, we found that synchronous oscillatory neural activity can dynamically carve ensembles out of larger overlapping networks. 
And this may endow critical cognitive ability, flexibility. Synchronized oscillations may allow neural ensembles to be temporarily formed and reconfigured on the fly, a way of quickly establishing neural ensembles, then quieting them down so another ensemble can be established so you can change from one ensemble to another very rapidly, which of course is the, uh, one of the hallmarks of, of human cognition, higher level cognition. And the results suggest provide direct evidence for the ensembles underlying different rules and also for a push-pull mechanism. Beta band coherence selects the ensemble, establishes the current ensemble the animal is going to use, whereas alpha suppresses a dominant, um, quiets down a dominant um, ensemble whenever uh, the animal has to use a weaker one. And this alpha, there's, there's lots of evidence showing that, uh, that, that um, when you, that an alpha um, orientation, alpha synchrony, alpha um, um, uh, frequencies are associated with, with um, inattention. When you close your eyes, when you, when, you, when you unfocus your attention, you get a big increase in alpha frequencies recorded off the scalp. So we think this alpha may, may be, at least in this case, may be playing a role in suppressing this, this, this uh, more dominant role. Now, this raises a question. If I'm, if I'm going to argue that, that ensembles are pulled out of neural circuitry by having them go into beta band synchrony with one another, um, how is it that you can have multiple thoughts in mind, activate multiple ensembles without them all suddenly oscillating together and becoming synchronized together in a haphazard way. How, how, do, we, how do we explain that? Well, at the same time, I'm going to give you the bottom line here is that we found in a previous study published a few years ago that when the animal is holding two thoughts in mind, holding, in this case, two pictures in mind simultaneously, the brain oscillates the different neural ensembles out of sync with one another, as if the brain is juggling the two of them to keep them separate from one another. And that's represented here. Here we have a representation of the spikes of individual neurons and the local field fluctuations in the local field potential reflecting this oscillating activity. And what we found in data, I'm just going to just very briefly show you, is that when the monkey's holding two thoughts in mind simultaneously, the spikes representing the two different ensembles line up on different phases of this ongoing population as if the brain is just oscillating them out, out, of, sync, out of phase of one another. Now, this is based on data which we recorded from the prefrontal cortex when the monkey's holding, uh, um, holding these, two, we cued the monkey with two pictures, and the monkey had to remember both the pictures and the order in which we presented them. So I'll, I'll spare the details of the task, but you're welcome to look at our paper if you, if you, if you want to know. Um, but what this shows in the pre, these are, this is local field potential power, frequency, on the y-axis over time in the prefrontal cortex. And these are delays, memory delays, where the monkey has to hold these two pictures in mind simultaneously. And we see this big increase in this around 32 hertz, 30 hertz or so oscillations around, around this time where the monkey's holding these two pictures in mind. And what we found when we looked at the relationship between individual spikes in the prefrontal cortex and this ongoing local field potential population oscillation is that the, the spikes that represented the two pictures, again, lined up on different phases of, these, phases of these ongoing population oscillations as reflected in the local field potential. And what this shows is a schematic diagram of the, of the local field potential depolarizing uh, to the right and repolarizing from left to right. And this shows actual data here of where we saw the maximum information about the two pictures the monkey's holding in mind. And then the monkey's holding, holding the pictures in a, in a certain order. And the first picture the monkey's cued to remember lines up in an earlier phase of the oscillation. And the second picture the monkey's supposed to remember lines up in a later phase of the oscillation. Again, as if the brain is, is juggling the two pictures out of phase of one another. Now, um, if you want to know whether this phenomenon really has a, a, um, a, a functional role, one thing we can look at is um, error trials. If, if, if the monkey makes an error and somehow this, this coding is involved in uh, the monkey holding these pictures in mind and holding them in the correct order, we should see these, these effects go away on error trials. And that's exactly what happens on trials in which the monkey gets the order of the pictures mi mixed up, which is, which is the bulk of the errors. This phase coding effect just goes away. So to conclude here, during working memory, prefrontal activity shows oscillatory synchronization in and around 32 and 3 hertz. I didn't talk about the 3 hertz because there's not much going on there in terms of phase coding. This is, more, this, is, this is more specific to higher frequency oscillations. Spikes carry more information about stimuli held in memory at partic particular, particular LFP phases. The first stimulus of a memorized sequence is encoded earlier in the LFP cycle, and the second stimulus is coding later in the LFP cycle for the 32 hertz oscillations, and we saw nothing like that at lower frequencies. So it's specific to the higher frequencies. So oscillations may not only bind ensembles together, they may, they may keep simultaneously activated ensembles from interfering with one another by oscillating them in and out of phase of one another. 
Now, what's interesting about this, I think, is that this may explain the most fundamental fact about consciousness. What's the most obvious fundamental objective fact we can all say about conscious thought? We only could think about one or two or a few things simultaneously. It's, it's almost impossible to hold more than a few things in mind simultaneously. Well, I submit to you that this may be due because there's only so, many, so much information you could pack into one oscillatory cycle. That is, only a few thoughts can be juggled in each cycle. So I submit to you that, that if this is the nature, if this, the, if this is if this phase coding, this oscillatory binding and phase coding um, is does explain the, the uh, uh, limited bandwidth of, um, of cognition. We, and our lab is doing experiments now where we're testing, we're loading up the monkey's working memory until the monkey reaches capacity and then fails. If we can see this, this phase coding effect break down in a way we expect just around the time the monkey reaches its working memory capacity, I'll submit to you that because capacity limitations are the most fundamental fact about conscious thought, that this turns out to be true, I'll submit to you that this may be one of the first examples of a real neural correlative consciousness. Thank you.